Well, today we're talking about how we need to speak life when we're surrounded by death. We need to speak life when we're surrounded by death. We have been surrounded by a spirit of death for over a year. We, we've tried to be immersed and indoctrinated and, 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 and baptized in this, this dogma of death. And so many people have been trying to figure out how they're going to survive. And, and, and the reality is, is the moment you start speaking life in this culture that we're in today, people kind of think you're crazy. You're, you're just not in touch with reality. Because, you know, you're just, you're just way out there instead of understanding what's going on. Have you not seen the news? Yeah, I've not seen the news, and that's why I can speak life. I've not been brainwashed. I've not been told what to think. Look, guys, just because the government tells you to do something or not do something, stop it. You need to be led by the Spirit of God. Nowhere in Romans chapter 8 does it say that you're to be led by the government. Matter of fact, the Word of God tells us that we are to lead the government, not the government lead us. We're to influence the government, not the government influence us. We're the ones that are the ones to speak God's word, not listen to the world's word. Some of you are like, man, I haven't seen this. I haven't heard this stuff before. Where, what are you talking about? I'm talking about life. Life will give you a different perspective. Life will put a smile on your face. Amen. You, some of you, are, you've got life. You're already Christmas shopping. Anyone? Anyone? It's already August. You better get started. My wife was talking about where to put the Christmas tree yesterday. I'm having hot flashes. Like, dear God, it's not even August. <laughs> Today it is. Has Costco got their Christmas stuff out yet? Because I want to choke them when I walk in there. I'm like, it's, it's August and they're selling Christmas stuff already. Jesus, help us. <laughs> Look, just because you're looking at a situation and it looks dead doesn't mean it is dead. Just because you think it's over doesn't mean that Jesus thinks it's over. And that's why we're going to talk about John chapter 11. We're in the book of John and uh, we're only in chapter 11. We're going to be talking about Lazarus. If you're not familiar with the story of Lazarus, it's not a story. It's not a nighttime story. It's not a little limerick. It's not a little something that you read at night and say, you know, with Mother Goose and John Thumb stuck his thumb in a plum and Mother Goose, right? It's not a story. It's not a fable. This is an actual account that took place. See, this is different, okay? This is not reality TV. Reality TV is not real. Okay, the pastors of L.A., that ain't real. <laughs> okay, so it says a man named Lazarus was sick and he lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. We'll talk a little bit about that to help give context to the gravity of the situation for Mary and Martha. This is Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. So I don't know if they sent an email, a text message, an Instagram. I don't know if it's slacker, poke. No, they sent a message saying, look, your best friend, literally, they were close, close friend, is sick. And we need you to come and fix this situation. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. Look, just because you have a situation right now, it doesn't mean that it's going to end in death. In death of a marriage, in death of a relationship, in death of your economy, in death of your business, because Jesus is involved, you get a God kind of outcome. It will not end in death. No, it will happen for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. See, sickness and disease did not originate from God because God cannot create things that are bad. He can only create things that are good. And because of the curse of the fall, sickness entered in. So if you get cancer, it didn't come from God. Quit saying God gave you cancer. Can't happen. He can heal you from cancer. Now here's, the, okay. The Bible says if a house, a house is divided, it cannot stand. He can't be against himself. He can't give you something and then take it away. 
because that conflicts the point or the purpose of sickness and disease. The purpose of sickness and disease is to bring death, to bring despair, to debilitate you, to prevent you from doing what God has called you to do. Why would God give you something and then expect you to do something that you can't do because he gave you something that prevents you from doing it? It doesn't make biblical sense. But that sickness or that disease or that challenge in your marriage or that challenge in your business or that challenge with your kids, it didn't originate from God, but God can use that situation for his glory and turn a miracle around. So it might look like divorce. It might look like cancer. It might look like unemployment. It might look hopeless, but let me tell you something. Let me, let me tell you how a Christian should do math. Math Christians, okay? You're talking to somebody that knows something about math. I got a D minus in geometry. Okay, the moment you put the alphabet in my math equations, it just, I lost, I'm thinking, A's for apple. <laughs> B is for banana. And you want me to get pie out of that? Where's the pie? Let's eat. Right? I'm thinking food. This is... <laughs> Okay, home ec and math met. <laughs> so, you never, you never take your circumstance and just make that the outcome. You always take your circumstance and look at it. Just look how bad it is, okay? Because some people, you know, some people that get into the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, they're the ones that will look at a situation and pretend that it's not real. Oh, don't say you have cancer because you don't have cancer. Just, just deny it. Deny it and it'll go away. Mm -hmm. Just like that divorce. <laughs> you try denying that divorce, see how quick it goes away. It doesn't, right? Denial doesn't work. But when you look at the situation and you realize the gravity of the situation in the natural, then we take God and put God into our equation. You never look at the outcome of your situation without putting God into in your equation. You always put God in your equation and then you get a God kind of outcome. Right? It's like, the, the, look, I love the math, you know, when you're doing times. I love doing times. Anytime there was a zero involved. 392,472,000.76 times zero. I know the answer to that one. Right? I mean, I, I just loved any time that you could time something by zero, I knew what the outcome was. And this is the way we need to be with God. No matter how bad your situation is, you times it by God, what do you get? God's outcome. I know the answer. It's always the same. Love God math. But the reality is, is we love to live life without faith. We do. As good Christians as we are. We run around and we just try to prove God how we can live life without faith and still please him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And matter of fact, it says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. And how many people are trying to prove God wrong? I, I can be a good Christian and not have faith. No, you can't. It's impossible. It's impossible to please God without faith, even though it's easier to walk around in doubt and fear and despair and how bad it is and doom and gloom and watch your CNN and watch. CNN stands for constant negative news. Anyone? Anyone? You're like, don't you touch my Fox News. <laughs> they need redeemed too. Some of those that you thought were saints lost their little halo. <laughs> the Bible says that Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, verse 5. And he stayed there for the next two days. Look, Jesus got the message, Lazarus is sick. Jesus loves Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And stayed another two days. Look. Just because it's not right timing for you doesn't mean it's not right timing for Jesus. Do you ever wish that God was less, less patient when it comes to our situations, right? It's like God has so much patience. God, will you fix this now? Anyone? Anyone? But, but the reality is, is 
God's timing is always our timing. What does that mean? That means when you trust in God's timing, it's always for your best. It's always for your best interest. It's always for your best benefit. When you trust in God's timing, even though it wasn't your timing, but when you agree with God's timing, you get a God outcome in your life. Too many times we get too impatient. I want to make miracle now. That was a play on McDonald's and this is a tough crowd. A McMiracle? I I better make move on <laughs> with this mix sermon. <laughs> it, here's 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 the challenge when we when we look at this account because most of us we know the outcome of the account. We already know the end of the movie. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Right? So then we look at the beginning and we look at when he's sick, when Lazarus is sick and Jesus is delaying, we're like, what's the big deal? He's just going to resurrect him anyways. Look, up to that point, Jesus had never resurrected anybody. He'd healed people, but he had never resurrected anybody. It's like a Hallmark movie. We know the ending. I don't care what the title is. It's the same movie with different actors. Same script. Boy meets girl. Boy and girl fall in love. Boy and girl get mad at each other. Break up. Looks impossible. Boy and girl kiss. The end. You don't have to watch another Hallmark. I don't get worried now when I watch Hallmark. Hallmark. I love watching Hallmark movies. These are the movies I love. And I'm sitting there watching, and, and it looks hopeless. It looks impossible. But I don't have to worry because I already know the end of the story. They're going to kiss. <laughs> Why? Because if they didn't kiss at the end of the movie, there would be no more Hallmark movies. There would be no more Hallmark channels. Here's a reality check for us. If there was no resurrection, there would be no hope for us. But we look at this account and we say, Mary, Martha, chill out. He's going to raise him up. It's Jesus. Don't you know that? No, they didn't know that. And so we, we get to look at them with our piety and our faith and say, oh, I would have believed. I would have trusted God. Well, you weren't there. You weren't there in their shoes or sandals. <laughs> you weren't there. I wasn't there. We have the benefit of knowing the end. They didn't. So it says, then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but <coughs> now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, taking a nap. But Jesus meant that Lazarus was dead. So he told them plainly, guys, gather around. Everyone, come here, everybody. Lazarus is dead he told them plainly. That's what he said. Because they didn't get it. He's dead. Gone. Over. In the natural life. Say it. Dead. And some, some of you, you don't want to know how bad your situation is. Because the mountain looks too big. And the closer you get to the mountain, the bigger it looks. Blake and I, we had the opportunity of traveling through Oregon. <clears throat> we saw the Steen Mountains. Uh, drive up 9,200 feet and go right up to the edge and look over. 9,200 feet. It's amazing. We saw the sisters. We saw Mount Bachelor. We saw Three Finger Jack. We saw Mount Hood. We saw Mount St. Helens. We saw all of these mountains up close. Mount Adams, Mount Rainier. It's amazing how big they get the closer you are. And some of you, you don't want to get real close to your mountains because it's too insurmountable. It looks too big. It looks too impossible. But you know what? Sometimes you just got to know how bad your situation is because until you acknowledge how bad the situation is, you will like never be able to acknowledge how big the miracle of God was in your life. He said, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you're really going to believe. Come, let's go and see. This is where we have to understand that our life is not for our life. When you're a Christian, you're not living for you. You're living for Christ. You made the, ex the exchange. You've laid down your life. You've taken up your cross. 
and you're going to follow him. And this means that we live a life that brings glory to God. And sometimes it's not always easy. And I got to thinking, what would it, what would it be like if we just lived a life that was always easy? Hmm. Kind of like a lot of Christians and a lot of churches that lived a life that was easy until COVID came. See, COVID didn't change our commitment. It revealed our commitment. It revealed what we were standing on. It revealed what we believed. I'm glad we're here today. I know it was terrible and all the stuff that we went through, but man, I think we're better for it. I think we're stronger for it. I think we're more resolute for it. I, I think we have seen the power and the resurrection of God work in the midst of death. <clears throat> but sometimes we just don't want to see how big the mountain is. So he said, yeah, let's go. Let's go. You're going to see the miracle. And then you got Thomas. Anybody know Thomas? The doubting Thomas. I'm not talking about this Thomas here. <clears throat> Thomas. He says, let's go to and die with Jesus. He's just like the most negative guy. Here, you've got the, all these disciples. They're living with Jesus. They're eating with Jesus. They're seeing miracles with Jesus. They're, 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 they're sleeping you know, in the same area as Jesus. I mean, here you've got this, this life with Jesus. And even though they're living life with Jesus, they're still in doubt, disbelief, and fear. They, they don't see what Jesus sees. They're... they're there's a lot of negativity in church today. A lot of negativity. You can come to church. You, you can have two people come to church. One person, whoo, I got a miracle. I got resurrection life. And the other guy's like, no, I'm just going to die. <laughs> Heard the same sermon. Heard the same words. But Hebrews 4, 2 and 6 says, unless we mix faith with the word of God, the word of God will not produce any fruit in our lives. You got you to have some belief. We just sang about it. I believe. Do you believe? Do you really believe? Do you really, really believe? Well, I don't know. Now there's this D variant. I was doing fine and I was getting back to normal. But now there's this D variant and I don't know. Maybe what if, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is the strain that they can't fix and, you know, the vaccine and what if, you know. At some point, you're going to have to figure out if you believe or not. At some point, and can I just say, I'm not going to say I'm prophesying. I might be. I might be. But in the future, if it doesn't come to pass, then I wasn't prophesying. <laughs> it was just a thought. I'm not, I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord. And I'm, I'm not going to have like word art on my YouTube video with Trump on there and, and the future. And, okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> I think we're going to get to a situation where there's going to be some churches, it's the only place that they will find the true healing power of God for their situation. Because they're going to find out that we have been betrayed. And that the only solution is Jesus Christ. And people are going to walk in and we're going to lay hands on them and pray the prayer of faith and they're going to be healed. Verse 17 said, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus has already been in the grave for four days. <laughs> in other words, you're late, Jesus. You missed it. Four days he's been gone. Four days he's been dead. Four days he's been in the tomb. You could have been here four days ago and fixed this situation, but now it's too late. Some of you are like this in your marriage. Four days, it's too late. Your four days means it's too late. Whatever you faced, it's over. You don't think there's a rewind. You don't think it can be restored. You don't think it can be changed. You don't think that custody agreement can be resolved. It's over. You don't understand. The judge said, which judge? <clears throat> which judge? In other words, they're trying to remind Jesus, this is beyond your fixing. I mean, you're good, Jesus. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> I mean, you healed that, that leprosy man, and you, you healed that blind man, and you delivered that demonic woman. I mean, you're good. You're just not that good. 
I mean, you got power, but you don't have resurrection power because nobody, nobody been resurrected from the dead. No. <clears throat> but you see, it says in verse 19, many of the people had already come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. People had left their homes. They've come to mourn the loss of Lazarus. We're all here for this purpose, to say goodbye, to cut any hopes. It's over. Four days Jesus, you didn't come in time, and here comes the mourners. Now, let me tell you something about Eastern culture mourning. When, when uh, like in Nepal, <clears throat> they have, uh, because we go there and do missions work, they have open cremations. So they have these altars in downtown Kathmandu at the Hindu temple. <clears throat> and what they do is they'll, they'll build up a base of wood uh, and kindling, and then they'll bring the body, and you watch all this. You just stand across the river and video it, photo it, whatever. And they'll come, they lay the corpse right there on top of the, the wood, and then they pile more wood on top of it. And then you got the family standing there, you got the Hindu priest standing there, and then they light the fire, and then they just keep the fire going until there's nothing left, and then they sweep all the ashes right into the river. And then people go in the river and they start panning for gold. Maybe they had gold teeth or what have you. I'm serious, it's crazy. <clears throat> and then you can go down the river a little bit and they'll get that water to drink. So every now and then though, if, if it's a well-to-do family, they'll hire a, a, a crier, a professional mourner. And so this guy, he has no attachment, he has no connection, but he's got a job, a career in crying. Uh, yeah, this is a dude, apparently. He's, he gets paid to cry. You'd have to pay me to cry, right? I mean, I don't want to cry unless I have to cry. Amen? <clears throat> Nothing wrong with crying if you cry, but I mean, I'm just not into crying if I don't have to cry. If you're into that, or okay. Anyways, I'm digging a hole. So this, this crier, he'll be, and he'll be, oh, and he screamed, oh, 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 oh. And he's good, you know? He sounds like he, it, was, it was his dad or something. Oh, ha, 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 ha. And he, you know, dirt and, and ash and he's trying to, and, and, and meanwhile, the family is like, they're the surrogate crier or something. I have no idea. It's the weirdest thing. But people get bought into this atmosphere of it's over. It's over. It's done. It's final. And you have to understand for Mary and Martha, this was the death of their brother was a curse upon their life because the tradition of that day in Eastern uh, culture is women could not own property. So that means now they're out. They have no future. They have no, no hope. So this, this was intense for them. And when Martha got the word that Jesus was coming, verse 20, she went and met him. But, Mar but Mary stayed in the house. Now, let me just interject this because this is Jesus that sh showed up, right? Martha comes out to meet, excuse me, Martha came out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. I think Mary stayed in the house because she was fuming. I'm just saying this. I'm not saying the words say this. I'm just saying that this is kind of our nature as humans. We're ticked at Jesus. He could have fixed this problem four days ago, but now he didn't. And here he is, shows up like he's the man. And like, I'm supposed to go out and meet, I'm ticked. My life is over. My life is wrecked. My brother is gone. I'm going to just sit here. I'm not going to go out and see him. Martha said, Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. <laughs> nice save, right? Right? This is your fault, but you could fix it if you really want. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he'll rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even after dying, will live. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. I like the, the redundancy, never, ever die, right? Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I've always believed that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come to save the world, uh, to, to come into the world from God. 
Then she returned to Mary, and she called Mary aside from the mourners and said, the teacher is here, and he wants to see you. You need to calm down. You need to go see Jesus. <laughs> so Mary immediately went out. Now, Jesus had stayed outside of the village at the place where Martha met him. Now, this is really important, though, because the mourners are there. People have a mindset, and I've, I've, I've been at hospital bedsides. My wife's been to hospital bedsides, and you can tell if there's a spirit of faith there or if it's just a bunch of mourners and, and it's over, right? And there are times that I have asked the family to leave the room because all I've heard was death and it's over and they're planning death. Meanwhile, the person in the bed's like, I still want to live. I, this is no joke. I mean, this person wants to live and this, they're already dividing up the estate and who gets what. I mean, I'm thinking if I walked out, there'd be a pillow over the guy's face. Kevorkian moment. And so I'm t I was talking to the gentleman in the hospital. But he didn't even come to our church. It was a friend of a friend that came. In, and so I go down there, and I'm standing there, and there's, and there's like, yeah, kidneys have shut down. When you hear kidneys have shut down, oh, yeah, divide the estate. You know, it's, it's, it's like mentally in the natural, it's there, okay? And I'm talking to the person, <clears throat> and I'm kind of talking because I didn't want the rest of the family here. And, and they're like, he's like, I, I want to live. <laughs> I'm like, I can agree with that. And I said, hey, uh, everyone, could I ask you to step outside the room? See, faith has a boldness. It can seem arrogant. It can seem rude. But faith will do what doubt and fear won't. So I said, uh, would you guys be able to step outside of the room? I, I just want to talk and pray with them privately. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Get, get, get out of here. <laughs> Shut the door. And, and we just came into agreement. You, you know, a lot of people, oh, we got to work for it. Oh, we got to toil for it. Oh, we got to tarry for it. I didn't even know this guy. And we just said, Father, in the name of Jesus, we proclaim healing in this body. We command resurrection life in this body because we believe not only that you can, but that you will. In Jesus' name, be healed. Amen. Yes. High five, left. And I see this, this individual at Walmart. Hey, pastor. I'm thinking, why aren't you at my church? <laughs> Jive turkey. Come to your hospital bed, agree with you in prayer, and you're not even coming to my church now. <laughs> God healed him miraculously. God healed him. And he didn't have to earn it. He didn't have to pay penance for it. He didn't, well, I got to come to your church now and pay tithes. No, because it's not me. <laughs> so when the people who were at the house that was consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed that she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her. Oh, we got to do our job. We got to do our job. We got to go cry. We got to go mourn because this is, this is bad. And in the natural, guys, it's bad. <clears throat> And so when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and other people wailing with her, a lot of people don't like to hear this part. So plug your ears if you don't want to hear this part. If you don't think that Je Jesus, he's just so compassionate. He's a hand patter. He's a console. Poor you. Not when there's a lack of faith. Not when there's a lack of faith. The Bible says a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. L let, me, let me help you with this, this concept of anger in the Greek. This word anger is translated in the Greek as a horse snorts. Moms, you know what I'm talking about. When you see your kids, you're like... <laughs> before, you, before you raise your voice... Right? Before you, 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 you bring correction, you, you get this. <laughs> That's literally what was in Jesus right there. It was anger. It was, it was something that rose up within him, a Holy Ghost boldness to say, this is unacceptable. <clears throat> Doubt angers God. 
You can't console doubt. You can't pet doubt. Doubt needs the jaws of life, the word of God to come and speak through your mouth. It needs a Holy Ghost crash cart to say, come alive in the name of Jesus. And there are times that I've been, we've been, you know, we were with your brother in the hospital bed and he was, I mean, he was like dead, but not yet. He wasn't like sleeping dead. He was almost dead. And we had to ask some family to leave the room and we prayed the prayer of faith and he's been back to church multiple times. Healed. Do you know what he said? Where'd you put him? Where'd you put him? I can, I, can just, I can just see him rolling up his sleeve. Where'd you put him? I don't doubt if he was flexing a little bit. He's like, I'm going to prove to you that I'm the son of God, that there's nothing too big for me. There's nothing impossible for me to do. And then they told him, you know, he's over there, the stone, uh, you know, Lord, come and see. And the Bible said that Jesus wept. A lot of people like to think that, well, you know, he's so compassionate. He was weeping because he, he was just meeting them where they're at. No, if he met them where they're at, we're all in trouble. Jesus doesn't stoop to our level. He raises us to his level. You can't stoop to doubt and fear. You have to raise those that are in doubt and fear up. And he wept. That's the thing that makes God and the heart of God weep is doubt and fear and a lack of trust in his ability and his word. And so many people, they're like, well, it's the sovereignty of God. I've heard the stupidest sayings in around funerals and memorials. Well, God needed another flower in his garden and he plucked the flower from the... <clears throat> babies that have died and you got people that, well, the Lord needed your baby more than you did. What kind of horses? What go- Some people need to just be punched in the nose because they have no idea the will and the plan of God. God can't give death. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die so that we can have life. We live in a fallen world and bad things happen, but God don't kill people. God causes people to live. Yeah, but it's the plan of God. If it was the plan of God, then why did the children of Israel stay an extra 40 years in the wilderness? If it was the plan of God. If it was the plan of God, why did Israel get a king when he said, I don't want you to have a king, but if you want a king, okay, I'll give you a king. Huh? If... if, Why did Samson have his eyes gouged out? That wasn't the plan of God. The plan of God was him to rule as a judge for the nation of Israel and to protect the nation. But no, he didn't follow the plan of God. So when you come to me with this idea of the sovereignty of God and God's in control, stop it. If God was in control, he'd make some of you pay your tithes. If God was in control, he'd stop abortion. If God was in control, there'd be people in Washington, D.C. right now in jail. If God was in control, there's coming a time when he's in control, when he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and say, I'm here to rule and reign. But until then, we've got to do our part. We got to believe. We got to pray. The Bible says pray for those that are in authority over us. Why? Because we are the ones that influence. This mindset of, oh, God's in control. Yes, God has a plan, but he's looking for people to fill the plan. God's in control. You know what that means? That we can just sit around with our hands in our pockets. Well, God's in control. Well, then why am I even preaching? If God's in control. If people are going to get saved, they're just going to get saved. If God's in control. Hmm. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. Jesus is weeping because of a doubt of faith. This, this doubt and this lack of faith. And Jesus isn't weeping because he's lost Lazarus. He's weeping because they're missing out on a miracle. Some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? I mean, you know, he's good, but he's not that good. 
Some of you, th you think that about your situation. Jesus is good, but he's not that good. He can't fix this situation. This, I mean, he's good, but this is so over. This is so done. This is so dead. It's so unrevival. This relationship is so destroyed. It's done. I know God, he's good, but he's not that good. In verse 38, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb in a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. And a lot of times we try to remind Jesus how impossible our situation is. Yeah, Jesus, I, I know you're good, but it's over. Stone's, Stone's here. He's been in there four days. Come on, let's just move on. You need to grip reality. You, you, you need to get your feet back on the ground, get your head out of the clouds. You need to come back to, to, to where we're living. Hello? You can't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. What do you say? Oh, okay, let's go. Let's go to Starbucks. No. He said, roll the stone aside. <laughs> and Martha protested. The dead man's sister, right? She protested, Lord, he's been in there for four days. The smell will be terrible. Has anybody ever smelled a dead body or a dead carcass? It has a scent of its own. Vicks on your nose, don't fix it. <laughs> it, it it's horrific. And, and we, we have to understand that we're not talking about embalming procedures that we have today. We're just talking about throw some... some Lemon and spices and everything nices and wrap them up really good. <laughs> Many times they, they just plug any holes in the body so the, the odors don't seep out. That's, that's the reality. We, we live in such a sheltered world in America. Meanwhile, you look at the funerals overseas and they got cotton stuffed up their nose because of the smell. So Martha's just trying to be practical. <laughs> so is Jesus. <clears throat> what happened? Well, a lot of people, they don't like faith because it can embarrass them. You're embarrassing me, Jesus. You're embarrassing me. This is, this is too far. You, you've pushed the boundary. I know you can't, can do amazing things, but this is too far. He's dead. He's been in there four days. He stinks. Stop it. You're embarrassing me. All these people are here. You're making a show out of this. Stop it. Jesus. And Jesus like, yeah, I'm making a show of the glory of God. So Jesus responded. He said, didn't I tell you that you'd see the glory of God if you believe? If you what? Believe. They rolled the stone aside and they, the, uh, Jesus looked up to the heaven. He said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of the people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. And then Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. The Bible said he shouted. Why is it that we have such free license in our home to shout? Anybody shout at your kids? Anyone? I said, take out the garbage. I said, anyone? Anyone? Oh, we're all, oh, we're just so, we're just so holy in our homes and we just never, I just think it and they do it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Like, totally. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> he shouted. There's some times you need to lift your voice and shout at the situation. Shout at the enemy. Shout at your mountain. And what happened? And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound in grave clothes. His face was wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus said, unwrap him. Let him go. I, let, let, let's just demonstrate. They roll the stone, you know, stone it's over there. And they, you know, the guys are tired. It's a heavy stone. We're just going to put it back because this is just a joke. And the next thing you know, we're, Lazarus, come out. Whatever. And here he comes out. Now, he was wrapped. Anybody know what it means to be wrapped? So he came out. Many people, you know, it's like, yeah, 
No, he's wrapped. He's mummified. He's like little bunny Fufu. Are you hearing me? And everybody's standing around and like, he's good. I didn't know he was that good. <laughs> Lazarus is like, oh, this is amazing. Whoa, whoa, somebody around me. This is incredible. And Jesus said, would somebody let this guy go, unloose him so he can give some glory to God. I'm telling you, this is a day and an age that we can believe and, and expect and, and, and be ready for some great things to happen in our lives. Yeah, but you don't understand. No, no, you don't understand. Look, look, you need to mix some faith with this word today so that you'll walk out here going, mm-hmm, that's my God. That's my God. He's good. No, no, he's even better than what I thought. Oh, he can do it. Oh, there is nothing impossible. See, when you, when you finally surrender to the will of Jesus for your life, you're probably going to have to go home and start unwrapping some things that you already put away and thought was over. Unwrap it. Unwrap, loose it. Let it go. Why? Because Lazarus' life was a living testimony. That's what really put Jesus on the notoriety block of being the Son of God and becoming a threat to the Jews, to the Pharisees. And the Sadducees, it's that after that momentous occasion, they went, mm, we got to take this guy out because we can't control him and he's bad for our business. Look, you have to realize the closer that you get to Jesus, the more prepared you better be to become an example of the glory of God in your life. And, and that's why a lot of people, they just like, don't come too close, Jesus. I love you, I wanna to go to heaven, but you get any closer, you're gonna start wanting to do things in my life that I'm gonna need some faith for. Mm-hmm, yeah. Welcome to heaven living. That's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to draw you close. He wants to do miracles, signs, and wonders in your life. He does. It's funny, you know, people think, well, miracles were done when the disciples died. So was your thinking. Because let me help you with this. The greatest miracle in all existence is a dead sinner becoming made alive as a born-again Christian. That's the greatest miracle. That's transformation. That means a dead spirit that wasn't connected with God is suddenly born again, made alive, and connected to God and feeling and sensing and knowing the connection. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's a miracle. So you think, well, healing, it doesn't work anymore. Well, you ought to hang around here. You'll see some. I remember Chell. Chell, he was, I think he was 12 or 13. Um, he had like seven open heart surgeries. He had a pacemaker. I mean, literally, they could have just put a zipper in his chest because he was just always being operated on. He couldn't stand any longer than like just two or three minutes. We had the ambulance called to come and pick him up just for standing because he had passed out. I, I think the ambulance came three to four times just because, for standing in the foyer. And, and man, the Spirit of God was moving and I, I just said, anybody, anybody want, want to be healed? You know, I'm thinking head cold. You know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe a little gout on the, on the ankle, <laughs> sore tooth, right? Here comes Chell. I'm like, let me warm up a little bit. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone got natural thinking going on in your head? Anyone? Yeah. And he comes up, and, and I just remember, that God remind me, it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. It's not my ability. I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Boom, he falls over. I'm like, dear God, he just died. <laughs> this kid wasn't raised in church. He don't know the, the courtesy fall. You, you know what I mean? The, the little Pentecostal courtesy fall, you know, when you, oh, okay. No, I just, boom. And I'm like, they didn't even catch him. I'm like, come on, guys. I'm like, lawsuit. 
They got this on video. And he gets up and I'm like, what happened? <laughs> I feel weird. What? No, I feel weird. I'm like, what do you mean you feel weird? He was on the heart donor list. I'm like, well, let's walk over here. <laughs> I mean, walking's a big deal. And then we come down here and I, right here. Huh? So well, walk over here with me because that, that's a, that was a monumental task. We walked over there. How you feel? Weird. I'm, well, let's walk over there. And then walked over there. And, oh, oh, wow. Well, let's pick up the pace. And he ran from there to there. Then he ran from there to there. The next week, he played football with the youth for the first time in his life. He was taken off the heart donor list. I believe in miracles. I, I, I fell 100 feet. I'm a miracle. I was healed, neck down, paralyzed, completely paralyzed. I believe in miracles. Do I look paralyzed to you right now? Can we just have fun in church? All right, I'm gonna pray for you. Stuff, real hurts, real pain, real loss. Mary and Martha pain. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know the real pain. Lord, you said that you even collect our tears in a jar. That means you understand it, but it doesn't mean that we have to live in that pain. Oh, yes, sorrow may be for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And this is our morning right here, right now. This is our AM. The sun is risen, and your light is upon our situation. And your resurrecting power is working in our situation right here, right now. Move and operate right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I see a wound of a child towards the father. A breach, a chasm, something that is just beyond anything that you could have imagined. But today, right now, you see resurrection power. But don't imagine what you think it should be. Just surrender to God and start his plan. Because resurrection doesn't always look like we thought it would look. In the name of Jesus. So here's the, here's the greatest miracle opportunity. If you're here today and you're not born again, I'm not talking about being christened as a child. I'm not talking about confirmation classes. I'm not talking about belonging to a church. I'm not even talking about, well, I give money in the offering. I'm talking about, have you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus is your Lord? Because that's how salvation comes. It doesn't come by working for it or being good enough for it. It doesn't come by just saying, well, I gotta get some things fixed and then, then he'll receive it. No, no, salvation comes when you not know the truth, but you surrender to the truth. So if that's you today and you wanna surrender to the truth, you wanna become a Christian, Christ living in you. In just a moment, we're gonna pray with those that are watching live on the internet. But right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count to three. And when I say three, and if that's you and you want to receive Christ, this is what it's going to look like. I'll count to three. You lift your hand. If you pray, lift your hand, then we're going to pray a prayer together. We're not going to single you out. Uh, I'll say the words, and we're going to pray with those that are watching online as well. I'll say the words. You repeat them after me, but take ownership of these words. Make them your words. And then at the end of the service, if you've raised your hands, we have a, a new believers team over here that will meet with you. Doug will give you the instructions. But this is the best decision of your life, and we don't think you should do it alone. So we, we want to help you. We want to help you, coach you, give you some, some resources, and, and be a strength in your life, okay? So that's, that's what it's looking like, everything right there. I just told you up front. So I'm going to count to three, and if that's you, get your hand up. Be bold. Be strong. Here it is. One, two, three. Lift it up if that's you today. Anyone at all? Help me, ushers. Yes, I see that hand there. Right on, brother. Anyone else? Right there, I see that hand. Looking in the balcony. Anybody up there? Amen. Let's pray with those that are online as well. Come on, everybody. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. 
Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Live in me as I live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, stand and sing it today.